offer, and that the alderman was her advisor on the occasion, declared that if he ever encountered the ex-mayor in Italy he would kill him. The courier baron's ground of offence was, that, had the queen received the money, a great portion of it would have fallen to his share, and that he considered himself as robbed by the alderman, whom he would punish accordingly. Caroline refused the proposals with scorn. In one of her characteristic letters she said, The 30th of April I shall be at Calais for certain, my health is good, and my spirit is perfect. I have seen no personas of any kind who could give me any advice different to my feelings and my sentiments of duty relative of my present situation and rank of life. Fearful of further obstacle on the part of the French government, she proceeded at once to Calais, dismissed her Italian court, and with Alderman Wood and Lady Anne Hamilton she went on board the Leopold sailing packet, then lying in the mud in the harbour. No facilities were afforded her by the authorities, the English inhabitants of Calais were even menaced with penalties if they infringed the orders which had been given, and no compliment was paid her, except by the master of the packet, who hoisted the royal standard as soon as Her Majesty set foot upon the humble deck of his little vessel. She sat there as evening closed in, without an attendant saving the lady already named and the alderman, who not only gave her his escort now but offered her a home. She had solicited from the government that a house might be provided for her, but the application had been received with silent contempt. Her progress from Dover to London was a perfect ovation. Mr. Brougham had given her good advice at St. Omer. If, he said, your majesty shall determine to go to England before any new offer can be made, I earnestly implore your majesty to proceed in the most private and secret manner possible. It may be very well for a candidate at an election to be drawn into towns by the population, and they will mean nothing but good in showing this attention to your majesty, but a queen of England may well dispense with such marks of popular favour, and my duty to your majesty binds me to say very plainly that I shall consider any such exhibition as both hurtful to your majesty's real dignity and full of danger in its probable consequences. That Brougham is afraid, said the queen, and so he was afraid of her, afraid of some scandal, unknown to him then, coming out after her arrival. If he could have had his way he would not have consented to her coming to England at all. The people saw in her a victim of persecution, and for such there is generally a ready sympathy. They were convinced, too, that she was a woman of spirit, and for such there is ever abundant admiration. There was not a town through which she passed upon her way that did not give her a hearty welcome, and wish her well through the fiery ordeal which awaited her. She reached London on the evening of the 7th of June, 1820, and the popular procession of which she was the chief portion passed Carlton House on its route to the residence of Alderman Wood, in South Audley Street. There Alderman Wood used to spread a rug for Her Majesty to tread upon, when, to satisfy the loud-tongued mob, she appeared twenty times a day on the little balcony. The Attorney General would not allow his wife to call on her, and Mrs. Denman received a similar prohibition from Mr. Denman, who, subsequently, regretted the course he had taken. The Queen had scarcely found refuge beneath the Alderman's hospitable roof when Lord Liverpool in the House of Peers, and Lord Castlereagh in the House of Commons, conveyed a message from the King to the Parliament, the subject of which was that, Her Majesty having thought proper to come to this country, some information would be laid before them, on which they would have to come to an ulterior decision, of vast importance to the peace and well-being of the United Kingdom. Each minister bore a green bag, which was supposed and perhaps did contain minutes of the report made by the Milan commissioners touching Her Majesty's conduct abroad. The ministerial communications were made in the spirit and tone of men who, if not ashamed of the message which they bore, were very uncertain and infinitely afraid as to its ultimate consequences. Not that they were wanting in an outward show of boldness. The soldiers quartered at the King's Mews, Charing Cross, 
had been so disorderly some days previous, allegedly because they had not sufficient accommodation, that they were drafted in two divisions to Portsmouth. When the Queen was approaching London a mob assembled in front of the guardhouse, and called upon the soldiers still remaining there to join them in a demonstration in favour of the Queen. Lord Sidmouth, who was passing on his way to the House of Lords, seeing what was going on, proceeded to the horse guards, called out the troops there, and stood by while they roughly dispersed the people. It was called putting a bold face upon the matter, but less provocation on the part of a government has been followed by revolution. A desire to compromise the unhappy dispute was no doubt sincerely entertained by ministers, and all hope was not abandoned, even after the arrival of the Queen. Mr. Rush, the United States ambassador to England at this period, permits us to see, in his journal, when this attempt at compromise or amicable arrangement of the affair was first entered upon by the respective parties. On the 15th of June that gentleman dined at Lord Castlereagh's with all the foreign ambassadors. A very few minutes, he says, after the last course, Lord Castlereagh, looking to his chief guest for acquiescence, made the signal for rising, and the company all went to the drawing room. So early a move was unusual, it seemed to cut short, unexpectedly, the time generally given to conversation at English dinners after the dinner ends. It was soon observed that his lordship had left the drawing room. This was still more unusual, and now it came to be whispered that an extraordinary cause had produced this unusual scene. It was whispered by one or another of the corps that his lordship had retired into one of his own apartments to meet the Duke of Wellington, as his colleague in the administration, and also Mr. Brougham and Mr. Denman, as counsel for the Queen in the disputes pending between the King and Queen. Mr. Rush, after mentioning that the proceedings in Parliament were arrested for the moment by members purporting to be common friends of both King and Queen, proceeds to state that the dinner at Lord Castlereagh's was during this state of things, which explains the incident at its close, the disputes having pressed with anxiety on the King's ministers. That his lordship did separate himself from his guests for the purpose of holding a conference in another part of his own house, in which the Duke of Wellington joined him as representing the King, with Mr. Brougham and Mr. Denman as representing the Queen, was known from the former protocol, afterwards published, of what took place on that very evening. It was the first of the conferences held with a view to a compromise between the royal disputants. On the 28th of June the American ambassador was at the levee at Carlton House, where he learns that the sensibilities of the king are intense, and nothing can ever reconcile him. The same diplomatist then presents to us the following graphic picture, the day was hot, excessively so for England. The king seemed to suffer. He remarked upon the heat to me and others. It is possible that other heat may have aggravated in him that of the weather. Before he came into the entree room, from his closet, of the diplomatic corps, taking me gently by the arm, led me a few steps with him, which brought us into the recess of a window. Look, said he. I looked, and saw nothing but the velvet lawn covered by trees in the palace gardens. Look again, said he. I did and still my eye only took in another part of the same scene. Try once more, said he, cautiously raising a finger in the right direction. Had a vein of drollery in him. I now for the first time beheld a peacock displaying his plumage. At one moment he was in full pride, and displayed it gloriously, at another he would halt, letting it drop, as if dejected. Of what does that remind you? said. Of nothing, said I, honey so I'd key mal why pants, for I threw the king's motto at him, and then added that I was a republican, he a monarchist, and that if he dreamt of unholy comparisons where royalty was concerned I would certainly tell upon him, that it might be reported at his court. He quietly drew off from me, smiling, 
and I afterwards saw him slyly take another member of the corps to the same spot, to show him the same sight. Meanwhile, the contending parties in Parliament wore about them the air of men who were called upon to do battle, and who, while resolved to accomplish their best, would have been glad to have effected a compromise which, at least, should save the honour of their principal. As Mr. Wilberforce remarked, there was a mutual desire to avoid that fatal green bag. There were many difficulties in the way. The Queen, naturally enough, insisted on her name being restored in the liturgy, and none of her friends would have consented for her, nor would she have done so for herself, that she should reside abroad without being introduced by the British ambassador to the court of the country in which she might take up her residence. The government manifested too clearly an intention not to help her in this respect, for they remarked that, though they might request the ambassador to present, they could not compel the court to receive her. They wanted her out of the way, bribed splendidly to endure an indelible disgrace. She was wise enough, at least, to perceive that to consent to such a course would be to strip her of every friend, and to shut against her the door of every court in Europe. Mr. Wilberforce hoped to act the MR harmony of the crisis, by bringing forward a motion expressive of the regret of Parliament that the two illustrious adversaries had not been able to complete an amicable arrangement of their difficulties, and declaring that the Queen would sacrifice nothing of her good name nor of the righteousness of her cause, nor be held as shrinking from inquiry, by consenting to accept the Council of Parliament, and forbearing to press further the adoption of those propositions on which any material difference of opinion is yet remaining. The Queen's especial advocate, Mr. Brougham, felicitously contrasted the eager desire of ministers to get rid of Her Majesty, by sending her out of the country with all the pomp, splendour, and ceremonies connected with royalty, with their meanness in allowing her to come over in a common packet, and to seek shelter in the house of a private individual. He added that the only basis on which any satisfactory negotiation could be carried on with Her Majesty was the restoration of her name to the liturgy. Mr. Denman, in alluding to the case of Sophia Dorothea, which had been cited by ministers as precedent wherein they found authority for omitting the Queen's name from the liturgy, remarked that, as to the case of the Queen of George I, to which allusions had been made, it was not at all in point. She had been guilty of certain practices in Hanover which compromised her character, and was never considered Queen of England. On the continent she lived under the designation of Princess of Halley, and though the Prince of Wales had afterwards called her to this country for the purpose of embarrassing the government of his father, to which he happened to be opposed, still she was never recognized in any other character than Electress of Hanover. In this statement it will be seen that the speaker calls her queen whom he denies to have been accounted as such, and he adds that the Prince of Wales called her to this country in his father's lifetime, when he had no power to do so, whereas he simply expressed to his friends his determination to invite her over if she survived his father as Queen Dowager of England. This invitation he never had the power of making, for his mother's demise preceded the decease of his father. Mr. Denman was far happier in his allusion to a ministerial assertion that the omission of the Queen's name from the liturgy was the act of the King in his closet. This assertion was at once a meanness and a falsehood, for, as Mr. Denman remarked, no one knew of any such thing in this country as the King in his closet. Indeed the ministers were peculiarly unlucky in all they did, for while they asserted that the omission was never made out of disrespect towards the Queen, they acknowledged that it never would have been thought of but for the revelations contained in the fatal green bag as to Her Majesty's alleged conduct. Finally, the House agreed to Mr. Wilberforce's motion. The announcement of the resolution to which the House of Commons had come was made to Her Majesty, now residing in Portman Street, in an address conveyed to her by Mr. Wilberforce and three other members of the lower house. On this occasion all the forms of a court were observed. The bearers of the address appeared in full court dress. The Queen, 
in a dress of black satin, with a wreath of laurel shaded with emeralds around her head, surmounted by a plume of feathers, stood in one portion of the little drawing room, behind her stood all the ladies of her household, in the person of Lady Anne Hamilton, and on either side of her Mr. Brougham and Mr. Denman, Her Majesty's Attorney and Solicitor Generals, in full-bottomed wigs and silk gowns. As the deputation approached, the folding doors which divided the members in the back drawing room from the Queen and her court in the front apartment were then thrown open, and the four gentlemen from the House of Commons knelt on one knee and kissed Her Majesty's hand. Having communicated to her the resolutions of the House, the Queen, through the Attorney General, returned an answer of some length, the substance of which, however, was, that with all her respect for the House of Commons she could not bind herself to be governed by its counsel until she knew the purport of the advice. In short, she yielded nothing, but appealed to the nation. When the assembled crowd learned the character of the royal reply its delight was intense, and certainly public opinion was generally in favor of the Queen and of the course now adopted by her. There was one thing she and the public too supremely hated, and that was the formation of a secret committee, formed principally two of ministerial adherents, and charged with prosecuting the inquiry against her, without letting her know who were her accusers or of what crimes she was accused and without affording her opportunity to procure evidence to rebut the testimony brought against her. Against such a proceeding she drew up a petition, which she requested the Lord Chancellor to present. That eminent official, however, asserting that he meant no disrespect, excused himself on the ground that he did not know how to present such a document to the House, and that there was nothing in the journals which could tend to enlighten him. The petition, however, the chief prayer in which was that the Queen's counsel might be heard at the bar of the House against an inquiry by secret committee, was presented by Lord Dacker, and the prayer in question was agreed to. The request of Mr. Brougham was for a delay of two months, previous to the inquiry being further prosecuted, in order to leave time for the assembling of witnesses for the defense witnesses whom the Queen was too poor to purchase and too powerless to compel to repair to England. Her Majesty's Attorney General asked this the more earnestly as some of the witnesses on the King's side were of tainted character, and one of them was an ex-domestic of the Queen's, discharged from her service for robbing her of 400 Napoleons. The learned advocate concluded by expressing his confidence that the delay of two months would not be considered too great an indulgence for the purpose of furthering the ends of justice, and providing that a legal murder should not be committed on the character of the first subject of the realm. The best point in Mr. Denman's speech in support of the request made by his leader was in the quotation from a judgment delivered by a former Lord Chancellor, and which was to this effect it was delivered with the eyes of the Speaker keenly fixed on those of Lord Eldon a judge ought to prepare the way to a just sentence, as God used to prepare his way, by raising valleys and taking down hills, so when there appeareth on either side a high hand, violent prosecutions, cunning advantages taken. Combination, power, great counsel, then is the virtue of a judge seen to make an equality equal, that he may plant his judgment as upon an even ground. While the lords were deliberating on the request for postponement, Lord Castlereagh was inveighing in the commons against the Queen herself, for daring to refuse to yield to the wishes of Parliament, and rejecting the advice to be guided by its counsel. Such rejection he interpreted as being a sort of insult which no other member of the House of Brunswick would have ventured to commit. That illustrious individual, he said, might repent the step she had taken. Meanwhile, the Commons suspended proceedings till the course to be decided upon by the Lords was finally taken. In the latter assembly Earl Grey made a last effort to stay the proceedings altogether, by moving that the order for the meeting of the secret committee to consider the papers in the green bag should be discharged. The motion was lost, but an incident in the debate which arose upon it deserves to be noticed. The omission of the Queen's name from the liturgy had been described as the act of the King in his closet. 
Lord Holland now charged the Archbishop of Canterbury as the advisor of the act, but Lord Liverpool accepted the responsibility of it for himself and colleagues, as having been adopted by the King in Council, at the ministerial suggestion. The Lords having resolved to commence proceedings by a preliminary secret inquiry, the Queen protested against such a course, but no reply was made to her protest. With the exception of appearing to return answers to the addresses forwarded to her from various parts of the country, she withdrew, as much as possible, from all publicity. Her personal friends, however, were busier than she required in drawing up projects for her which she could not sanction. One of these busy advocates thought that she might fittingly compromise the matter by gaining the restoration of her name in the liturgy, being crowned, holding one drawing room, yearly, at Kensington Palace, and having her permanent residence at Hampton Court, with 55,000L. A year to uphold her dignity. The terms were not illiberal, but if the Queen rejected them, it was, probably, because she knew they would never be offered. Her own remark upon them is said to have been, that she did not want a victory without a battle, but a victory after showing that she had deserved it. She was the more eager for battle from the fact that the contents of the green bag were by no means unknown to her. At least, it has been asserted that she had long held duplicates of some of the evidence, if not of the report made by the Milan commissioners, and she was satisfied she could rebut both. She possessed one, and it was her solitary, advantage in this case. The ministers, if not in so many words, yet by their proceedings, had stigmatized her as utterly infamous, and yet they had considered it not beneath them to desire to enter into negotiations with one whom they considered guilty of all the implied infamy. The Queen's rejection of the proposals to compound the stupendous felony raised up for her many a friend in circles where she had been looked upon, if not as guilty, yet, at best, as open to very grave suspicion. The Queen's health required her not to confine herself within the narrow limits of her residence in Portman Street. She accordingly paid one public visit to Guildhall, and occasionally repaired to Blackheath. It was on her way back from one of these latter excursions that she honoured Alderman Waitman's shop with a visit. The incident is perhaps as well worth noticing as that which tells of the trip made by the young Queen Mary to the shop of Lady Gresham, the Lady Mayoress, who appears to have dealt in millinery. The city progresses of the Queen did her infinite injury. The very lowest of the populace, who cared little more for her than as giving opportunity for a little excitement, were wont on these occasions to take the horses from her carriage, harness themselves to the vehicle, and literally drag the Queen of England through the mud of the metropolis. She could only suffer degradation and ridicule from such a proceeding, which a little spirit might have prevented. Her enemies bitterly derided her through their organs in the press. They expressed an eagerness to get rid of her, and added their indifference as to whether the alien was finally disposed of as a martyr or as a criminal. On the other hand, her overzealous partisans gave utterance to their convictions that there was a project on foot to murder the Queen. Party spirit never wore so assassin-like an aspect as it did at this moment. Caroline, it must be added, was not displeased with these popular ovations. I have derived, she remarked in her reply to the city address, unspeakable consolations from the zealous and constant attachment of this warm-hearted, just, and generous people, to live at home with and to cherish whom will be the chief happiness of the remainder of my days. But her chief occupation now was to look to her defence, for the time had arrived when her accusers were to speak openly. Chapter 9 Queen, Peers, and People 
the secret committee on the Queen's conduct encounter between the Queen and Princess Sophia Bill of Pains and Penalties brought into the House of Lords the Queen demands to know the charges against her her demand refused the Queen again petitions Lord Liverpool's speech the Queen's indignant message to the Lord's money spent to procure witnesses against her public feeling against the Italian witnesses Dr. Parr's advice to the Queen his zealous advocacy of her cause Lord Erskine's efforts in her favor her hearty protest against legal oppression gross attack on her in a provincial paper cruel persecution of her her sharp philippic against ministers Lord John Russell's letter to Mr. Wilberforce, and petition to the King the Queen at Brandenburg House death of the Duchess of York her eccentricities her character addresses to the Queen, and her replies. The secret committee charged with examining the documents in the sealed bags made their report early in July. This report was to the effect that the documents contained allegations, supported by the concurrent testimony of witnesses of various grades in life, which deeply affected the honor of the Queen, charging her, as they did, with a continued series of conduct highly unbecoming Her Majesty's rank and station, and of the most licentious character. The committee reluctantly recommended that the matter should become the subject of solemn inquiry by legislative proceeding. The ministers postponed any explanation as to the course to be adopted by them upon this report until the following day. The Queen exhibited no symptoms of being daunted by it. She appeared in public on the evening of the day on which the report was delivered, and, if cheers could attest her innocence, the Vox Populi would have done it that night. As the Queen's carriage was passing in the vicinity of Kensington Gate it encountered that bearing the Princess Sophia. The two cousins passed each other without exchanging a sign of recognition, and the doughty livery servants of the Princess showed that they had adopted the prejudices or convictions of their portion of the royal family by refusing obedience to the commands of the mob, which had ordered them to uncover as they passed in presence of the Queen. On Wednesday, the 5th of July, Lord Liverpool brought in the ever-famous Bill of Pains and Penalties, a bill of degradation and divorce. Lord Liverpool had previously protested against a divorce. Why he now turned to a still more dangerous expedient he explains in a letter inserted in his memoirs. In the case of a private individual the question of divorce is a question of personal relief. The law of man, not the law of God, says properly in this case, we will not give you the relief unless by your conduct you are entitled to it. But the king does not, and cannot, apply for relief as an individual, his accusation is a public accusation, resting on public grounds. Adultery in a queen is a crime against the state. The private offense is merged in the public crime, and must follow the effect of it. How is it possible to entertain a charge of recrimination against a king, who in the eye of the law can do no wrong? The queen demanded, by petition, to be furnished with the specific charges brought against her, and to be heard by her counsel in support of that demand. The house refused, and Lord Liverpool went on with his bill. The queen again interfered by petition, requesting to have the nature of the charges against her distinctly stated, and to be heard in support of her request by counsel. These requests were negatived. Lord Liverpool then, in introducing the bill, did his utmost to save the king from being unfavorably contrasted in his character of complainant with the queen in that of defendant. He alleged that their majesties were not before the house as individuals. The parties concerned were the Queen as accused party and the state. The question to be considered was whether, supposing the allegations to be substantiated, impunity was to be extended to guilt, or justice be permitted to triumph. The bill he thus introduced noticed the various acts of indiscretion which have been already recorded. These were the familiarity which existed between herself and her courier, whom she had ennobled, and in honor of whom she had unauthorizedly founded an order of chivalry, of which he had been appointed Grand Master. The bill further accused her of most scandalous, vicious, and disgraceful conduct with the said Bergami, but was silent as to time and place. 
the document concluded by proposing that Caroline Amelia Elizabeth should be deprived of her rank, rights, and privileges as queen, and that her marriage with the king be dissolved and disannulled to all intents and purposes. The bill, in short, pronounced her infamous. It was the penalty which she paid for the exercise of much indiscretion. Earl Grey complained of the want of specification, and asserted Her Majesty's right to be furnished with the names of witnesses. Lord Liverpool, however, treated the assertion as folly, and the claim made as unprecedented and inexpedient. A copy of the bill was delivered to the Queen by Sir Thomas Tyrewitt. She received it not without emotion, and this was sufficiently great to give a confused tone to her observations on this occasion. Had the bill, she said, been presented to her a quarter of a century earlier, it might have served the king's purpose better. She added that, as she should never meet her husband again in this world, she hoped, at least, to do so in the next, where certainly justice would be rendered her. To the lords she sent a message expressive of her indignant surprise that the bill should assume her as guilty simply upon the report of a committee before whom not a single witness had been examined. Her friends continued to harass the government. In the Commons, Sir Ronald Ferguson attempted, though unsuccessfully, to obtain information as to the authority for the organizing of the Milan Commission for examining spies. That commission, he intimated, originated with the Vice-Chancellor, Sir John Leach, and had cost the country between 30 and 40 thousand pounds, for one half of which sum, he added, Italian witnesses might be procured who would blast the character of every man and woman in England. The feeling against Italians did not require to be excited. Those who arrived at Dover to furnish evidence against the Queen were very roughly treated, and so fearful were the ministers that something worse might happen to them, that they were, after various changes of residence in London, transferred to Holland, much to the disgust of the Dutch, before they were finally cloistered up in Cotton Garden, at hand to furnish the testimony, for the bringing of which they received very liberal recompense. Meanwhile, Dr. Parr, in ponderous sermons, exhorted Her Majesty not to despise the chastening of the Lord, and the Queen's devout deportment at divine service was cited by zealous advocates as evidence in favour of her general propriety. Indeed the Queen had no more zealous champion than the almost octogenarian par. On the flyleaf of the prayer book in the reading desk of his parish church at Hatton he entered, and one can hardly say of Dr. Parr's act on this occasion de Sibi, a stringent protest against the oppression to which she had been subjected, adding a conviction entertained by him of her complete innocence, and expressing a determination, although forbidden to pray for her by name, to add a prayer for her mentally, after uttering the words in the liturgy, all the royal family. In his heart the stout old man prayed fervently, nor did he confine himself to such service. A friend, knowing his opinions, his admiration of the Queen, and the friendly feelings which had long mutually existed between them, earnestly begged of him not to interfere in her affairs at this conjuncture. Dr. Parr answered the request by immediately ordering his trunk to be packed, and by proceeding to London, where he entered on the office of Her Majesty's chaplain, procured the nomination of the Reverend M. Fellows to the same office, and in conjunction with him, and often alone, wrote those royal replies to popular addresses which are remarkable for their force, and for the ability with which they are made to metaphorically scourge the king, without appearing to treat him with discourtesy. There was as much zeal, and perhaps more discretion, in those impartial peers who, on occasion of Lord Liverpool moving the second reading of the bill for the 17th of August, insisted on the undoubted right of the Queen, as an accused party, to be made acquainted with the names of the witnesses who had come over to charge her with infamy. Lord Erskine was particularly urgent and impressive on this point, but all to no purpose, except the extracting an assurance from Lord Chancellor Eldon that the accused should have, at a fitting season, 
a proper opportunity to sift the character of every witness as far as possible. Lord Erskine repeatedly endeavoured to obtain the full measure of justice for the accused which he demanded. The Queen herself entered a hearty protest against the legal oppression, and further begged by petition that, as the names of the witnesses against her were withheld, she might at least be furnished with a specification of the times and places, when and where she was said to have acted improperly. The request was characterized by Lord Eldon as perfectly absurd, seeing that the Queen could make no use of the information, if she intended, as declared by her, to defend her case at the early period named, of the 17th of August. The reply was harsh, insulting, and illogical. But to harshness and insult she became inured by daily experience. It may be safely said that, if such a drama had to be enacted in our own days, the press would certainly not distinguish itself now exactly as it did then. Party spirit might be as strong, but there would be more refinement in the expression of it. And assuredly, not even a provincial paper would say of a person before trial as a Western journal said of the Queen that she was as much given to drunkenness as to other vices, and that it was ridiculous to hold up as an innocent victim a woman who, if found on our pavement, would be committed to Bridewell and whipped. But ministers themselves were not on a bed of roses. They were exceedingly embarrassed by the Queen's announcement that she intended to be present every day in the House of Lords during the progress of what was now properly called the Queen's trial. Their anger, too, was excited at the sharp Philip picks against them inserted in Her Majesty's replies to the addresses presented to her. In those replies the passages complained of wounded more than those against whom they were pointed, and the authors of them had, no doubt, some mirth over sentences intended to spoil it in the breasts of ministers charged with rebelliously seeking to dethrone their lawful queen. The royal replies, too, were equally, but not so directly, severe against those former counsellors and advocates of Her Majesty who were now arrayed on the side of Her Majesty's enemy. These replies were, of course, not censured by the ministerial opponents in either House of Parliament. The addresses which called them forth, however, did not escape reproach from this quarter. Lord John Russell, in a letter to Mr. Wilberforce, does not indeed go so far as reproach. He says, I regret, though I cannot severely blame, the language of many of the addresses that have been presented to the Queen. Lord John acknowledged the political nullity of the Whigs at this time, but he held that the Wilberforce party in the Commons were sufficiently powerful to have successfully resisted the scandal which the government had brought upon the kingdom. In your hands, sir, he says, is perhaps the fate of this country. The future historian will ask whether it was right to risk the welfare of England her boasted constitution, her national power on the event of an inquiry into the conduct of the Princess of Wales in her villa upon the Lake of Como? From the majority which followed you in the House of Commons, he will conclude you had the power to prevent the die being thrown. He will ask if you wanted the inclination. To this letter Lord John Russell appended a form of petition to the King, which may not uncourteously be termed the petition of the powerless Whig statesman. This petition smartly and smartingly complimented His Majesty upon his liberality in offering to allow his Queen 50,000 a year, and to introduce her to a foreign court, at a time when he pretended to know that she was, allegedly, perfectly worthless, as woman, wife, and mother. With the domestic broils of King and Queen Lord John would not interfere, but, the King having made of them an affair of state, the humble petition informs His Majesty that he has been exceedingly ill-advised. With excellent spirit does Lord John place upon record his abhorrence of enacting laws to suit a solitary case laws which at once create the offence, regulate the proof, decide upon the evidence, and invent the punishment. He asks if the Queen will escape from justice in the event of the bill not passing? Are the ministers afraid lest she may so defraud justice, why, 
that the Queen has not fled from justice is not only the admission, but forms one of the chief charges, of her prosecutors. Her prosecution, then, will not serve the state. Can the revelation of her alleged iniquity at Como or Athens serve or influence public morals in England? What is the situation of the Queen? asks Lord John, who thus replies to his own query, separated from her husband during the first year of her marriage, she has been forced out of that circle of domestic affections which alone are able to keep a wife holy and safe from evil. For the period to which the accusation extends she has been also removed from the control of public opinion the next remaining check the world can afford on female behavior. Lord John perhaps makes a low estimate of female virtue when he thus concludes that women cease to be holy and safe from evil when they cease to have a share in domestic affections or to be controlled by public opinion. There is more sly humor in what follows than there is of correctness in the noble lord's estimation of female virtue. The drawer-up of the petition reminds the king that what most distresses him is the uncrowning a royal head without necessity. We see much to alarm us in the example, nothing to console us in the immediate benefit. Not, says the petitioner, slyly, that we do not recognize the right of Parliament to alter the succession to the Crown. None respect more than we do the Act of Settlement which took away the Crown from its hereditary successors and gave it to the House of Brunswick, and, as the writer alludes to the possibility of the new subject of strife bringing the country to the verge of a civil war, he of course intimates that Parliament may again be called upon to regulate the succession. The sum of the petition is to let the Queen alone. From her future conduct your Majesty and the nation will be enabled to judge whether the reports from Milan were well founded, or whether they were the offspring of curiosity and malice. The prayer of the petition, therefore, is that Parliament be prorogued, and thus end all proceedings against the Queen. Of course this petition was really a political pamphlet, introduced for no other purpose but the exposition of certain opinions. The Queen's replies to the popular addresses borrowed something of the tone of this document, and were partly sarcastic, partly serious, in regretting that an impartial tribunal was not to be found on this occasion in the House of Lords. Her Majesty now once more changed her residence from Portman Street to Brandenburg House, the old suburban residence of the Margravine of Anspach, on the banks of the Thames, near Hammersmith, where watch and ward were nightly kept by volunteer sentinels from among some of the more enthusiastic inhabitants of the vicinity. The distance, however, was too great to enable Her Majesty to repair conveniently to the House of Lords when her trial should be in progress. The widow of Sir Philip Francis had compassion upon her, and made her an offer, promptly accepted, of the widow's mansion in St. James's Square. It was next to that of her great enemy, Lord Castlereagh, and to reach the House of Lords she would daily have to pass Carlton House, the residence of the husband who was so blindly bent upon consigning her to infamy. In the midst of these preparations for a great event died a princess as unfortunate as Caroline, but one who bore her trials with more wisdom. The Duchess of York, the wife of the second son of Queen Charlotte, died on Friday, the 6th of August. Her married life had been unhappy, and every day of it was a disgrace to her profligate, unprincipled, and good-tempered husband. She endured the sorrows which were of his inflicting with a silent dignity and some eccentricity. In her seclusion at Oatlands this amiable, patient and much-loved lady passed a brief career, marked by active beneficence. Her blue eyes, fair hair and light complexion are still favorite themes of admiration with those who have reason to gratefully remember her. A great portion of her income was expended in founding and maintaining schools, encouraging benefit societies, and relieving the poor and distressed. But her benevolence had an eccentric side, and the indulgence of it was the only indulgence she allowed herself. She loved the brute creation, and had an especial admiration for dogs. Of these she supported a perfect colony, and daily might her canine friends, 
of every species and in considerable numbers, be seen taking their airing in the park, often with their benevolent hostess leading the way and taking delight in witnessing their gambols. She, perhaps, was the more attached to them because she had been so harshly used by man, and a touch of misanthropy was probably the basis of her regard for animals. The progeny of her established favorites were boarded out among the villagers, and in the park was a cemetery solely devoted as the burial ground of her quadruped friends. They rested beneath small tombstones, which bore the names, age, and characters of the canine departed. In these things may be seen the weak side of her character, but it was a weakness that might be easily pardoned. Her character had its firm, and perhaps humorous, side. She had put Ronies the party of strolling actors, and sent her foreign servants, who could comprehend little, to listen to the moan of Shakespeare murdered in a barn. Shortly after, an earnest and itinerant Wesleyan hired the same locality, and the Duchess ordered the household down to listen to the sermon. The foreigners among them pleaded their ignorance of the language as an excuse for not going. No, no, said the Duchess, you were ready enough to go to the play, and you shall also go to the preaching. I am going myself, and in the barn at Weybridge the official successor of John Wesley expounded scripture to the lineal successor of Frederick the Great. She had not the spirit of Caroline, and was all the happier for it. The latter, indeed, was more harshly tried, but she in some degree provoked the trial, and was now suffering the consequences of the provocation. The Queen gave a few days to retirement, in consequence of the death of the Duchess, and, this duty performed, she was again in public, working with energy and determination to accomplish the restoration of a name which had been tarnished by her own indiscretion. And indiscretion is perhaps one of the most ruinous ingredients in a character. It is a torch in the hand of the careless, firing the very garments of the bearer. The addresses to the Queen now became greater in number and stronger in language. The replies to them also became more energetic and menacing in expression. They were still popularly ascribed to Dr. Parr, and, from whomsoever proceeding, the author very well kept in view the personage for whom and the circumstances under which he was speaking. Thus, to the deputation from Canterbury, one paragraph of the royal reply was in these words, when my accusers offered to load me with wealth, on condition of depriving me of honor, my habitual disinterestedness and my conscious integrity made me spurn the golden lure. My enemies have not yet taught me that wealth is desirable when it is coupled with infamy. This was something of self-laudation, but in answer to the Norwich address the Queen directed attention from herself to the perils which menaced the state through her prosecution. The manner of that prosecution was described by her as ultimately threatening the vital interests of individual and general liberty. The question at this moment is not merely whether the Queen shall have her rights, but whether the rights of any individual in the kingdom shall be free from violation. There was more dignity in the sentiment and language than in the Queen's letter addressed to the King. Of course this epistle was not the Queen's, but a mere manufacture, which the King, naturally enough, would not read, or at least would not acknowledge that he had read. Your court became much less a scene of polished manners and of refined intercourse than of low intrigue and scurrility. Spies, bacchanalians, tale-bearers, and foul conspirators swarmed in those places which had before been the resort of sobriety, virtue, and honor. But the object of the letter was less to contrast the regent's court with that of the Queen Charlotte than to protest against the constitution of the court before which she was to be tried. In that court, she said, her accusers were her judges, the ministers who had pre-condemned her commanded the majority, and the husband who sought to destroy her exercised an influence there perilous to the fair award of justice. She demanded to be tried according to law, you have left me nothing but my innocence, she remarked, and you would now, by a mockery of justice, deprive me of the reputation of possessing even that. 
In the reply to the middle sex address occurs the sole admission of blame attaching to her through indiscretion. My frank and unreserved disposition may, at times, have laid my conduct open to the misrepresentations of my adversaries. But I am what I seem, and seem what I am. I feel no fear, except it be the fear that my character be not sufficiently investigated. I challenge every inquiry. I deprecate not the most vigilant scrutiny. Against the method of carrying on the scrutiny she continued to protest most heartily. In the Bill of Pains and Penalties, she replied to the address from Shoreditch, my adversaries first condemn me without proof, and then, with a sort of novel refinement in legislative science, proceed to inquire whether there is any proof to justify the condemnation. To the more directly popular mind, to the address of the artisans, for instance, she delivered an answer in which there is the following passage, who does not see that it is not owing to the wisdom of the deity, but to the hard-heartedness of the oppressors, when the sweat of the brow during the day is followed by the tear at its close. This was stirring up popular opinion against the king, of whom she invariably spoke as her oppressor. She, however, as significantly directed the public wrath against the peers in her reply to the Hammersmith address, wherein she says, to have been one of the peers who, after accusing and condemning, affected to sit in judgment on Queen Caroline, will be a sure passport to the splendid notoriety of everlasting shame. The married ladies of London went up to her with an address of encouragement and sympathy. Her answer to this document contained an asseveration that she was not unworthy of the sympathy of English matrons. I shall never sacrifice that honour, she observed, which is the glory of a woman. I can never be debased while I observe the great maxim of respecting myself. An eyewitness well remembers seeing several of these ladies, principally wives of small shopkeepers, descend from the hackney coaches in which they were conveyed to Brandenburg House. They descended the steps as a man comes down a ladder. The Queen's answer to them was, however, full of dignity. But her reply to the inhabitants of Greenwich had even more of the matter in it that would sink deep in the bosoms of mothers. After alluding to the period when she was living happily with her daughter, among those who were now addressing her, she added, can I ever be unmindful that it was a period when I could behold that countenance which I never beheld without vivid delight, and to hear that voice which to my fond ear was like music breathing over violets? Can I forget? No, my soul will never suffer me to forget that, when the cold remains of the beloved object were deposited in the tomb, the malice of my persecutors would not even suffer the name of the mother to be inscribed upon the coffin of her child. Of all the indignities I have experienced, this is one which, minute as it may seem, has affected me as much as all the rest. But if it were minute, it was not so to my agonizing sensibility. But she observed in her reply to the Barnard Castle address, my conscience is without a pang and what have I to fear? Her Majesty at the same time seldom allowed an opportunity to escape of placing the king in, if the phrase may be allowed, a metaphorical pillory. To pretend, she thus spoke to the Bethnal Green deputation, that His Majesty is not a party, and the sole complaining party, in this great question, is to render the whole business a mere mockery. His Majesty either does or does not desire the divorce which the Bill of Pains and Penalties proposes to accomplish. If His Majesty does not desire the divorce, it is certain that the state does not desire it in his stead, and if the divorce is the desire of his majesty, his majesty ought to seek it on the same terms as his subjects, for in a limited monarchy the law is one and the same for all. In the answer to the people of Sheffield the same spirit is manifested. It would have been well for me, she exclaims, and perhaps not ill for the country, if my oppressor had been as far from malice as myself, for what is it but malice of the most unmixed nature and the most unrelenting character which has infested my path and waylaid my steps during a long period of twenty-five years? Her complaint was, 
that during that quarter of a century her adversaries had treated her as if she had been insensible to the value of character. For why else, she asks, in addressing the reading deputation, why else should they have invited me to bring it to market, and let it be estimated by gold? But a good name is better than riches. I do not dread poverty, but I loathe turpitude, and I think death preferable to shame. Finally, she flattered the popular ear by placing all the authorities in the realm below that of the sovereign people. In her reply to one of the city ward addresses occurs the assertion that, if the power of king, lords, and commons is limited by the fundamental laws of the realm, their acts are not binding when they exceed those limitations. If it be asked, what then, are kings, lords, and commons answerable to any higher authority? I distinctly answer, yes. To what higher authority? To that of God and of the people. Lord John Russell, too, told the king that the crown was held at the will and pleasure of the parliament, and the queen, speaking on that hint, now maintained that crown and parliament were, under certain contingencies, beneath the heel of the papal souverain. It perplexed many of the clergy that the Princess of Wales should be continued to be prayed for up to the period of George III's death, but that Queen Caroline should not be named in the liturgy after the decease of the only true friend she ever had in the royal family. One military chaplain, a Mr. Gillespie, of a Scotch yeomanry regiment, was put under arrest for daring to invoke a blessing upon her in his extemporary prayer for the royal family, but this was the only penalty inflicted for the so-called offence. Chapter X The Queen's Trial The Queen's reception by the House of Lords Royal Progress to the House The Queen's enthusiastic reception by the populace Their treatment of the King's party Marquis of Anglesey The Duke of Wellington's reply to them The Attorney General's opening speech Examination of Theodore Majeki The Queen overcome at the ingratitude of this knowing rogue Disgusting nature of the evidence Other witnesses examined Mr. Brougham's fearless defense of the Queen Mr. Denman's advocacy not less bold his Denunciation of the Duke of Clarence question of throwing up the bill entertained by ministers stormy debates Lords Grey and Grosvenor in favour of the Queen Duke of Montrose against her ministerial majority the Queen protests against the proceedings the ministers in a minority the bill surrendered by Lord Liverpool reception of the news by the Queen her unspeakable grief. The Queen's trial, as the proceedings in the House of Lords were called, commenced on the 17th of August. Now we are in for it, Mr. Denman, said Her Majesty's Attorney General to her Solicitor General. With what spirit Brougham went in for it has been left on record by Lord Denman himself, in the memoir edited by Sir Joseph Arnold. Let me here state, once for all, that from this moment I am sure that Brougham thought of nothing but serving and saving his client. I, who saw him more nearly than any man, can bear witness that from the period in question his whole powers were devoted to her safety and welfare. He felt that the battle must be fought, and resolved to fight it manfully and to the utterance. The Queen had signified her intention of attending daily in the House during the proceedings, and suitable accommodation and attendance were provided for her. In the House, at all events, she was treated as Queen Consort, and she more than once adverted to the fact when about to take her seat on the throne-like chair and cushion placed at her disposal, near her council. Her usual course was to come up from Brandenburg House early in the morning to the residence of Lady Frances in St. James's Square. From the latter place she proceeded, in as much state as could be got up with her diminished means, to the House of Lords. On these occasions she was attended by Lady Anne Hamilton, her chamberlains, Sir W. Gell and Mr. Keppel Craven, and Alderman Wood, who invariably endeavoured to have the honour of escorting the Queen into the house, but was as invariably forbidden to pass in that way by the local authorities. The Alderman, being a member of Parliament, was compelled to pass through the entrance allotted to the Commons, and the Queen, who was received with military honours, was usually led into the house, or to the apartment assigned to her use, 
by Sir Thomas Tyrewit and Mr. Brougham, each holding her by a hand. The royal progress from St. James's Square to the House of Peers and the return were daily witnessed by a dense multitude, and hailed with acclamations. The Queen thought the popular sympathy for her far stronger than it really was. It did not indeed want for earnestness, intensity, or honesty, but it did not go deep enough to urge the multitude to make any serious demonstration in her favor. They cheered her as she passed, cheered the soldiers who saluted her, and hissed those who failed to show her that mark of respect. They hissed or cheered the peers on their arrival according as they knew that they were opponents or supporters of the Queen. They were especially delighted when they succeeded in compelling a lordly adversary to shout, or seem to shout, for the Queen. They strove mightily to bring the Marquis of Anglesey to this, but on his assertion that rather than do a thing against his inclination they might run him through the body, they laughed, cheered, and let him pass on. The Duke of Wellington served those who assailed him quite as characteristically, he was violently hissed on his way to the house on the first day of the trial, he checked his horse for a moment, looked round with a half-smile, as if the people had been guilty of some absurd mistake, and then quietly walked his horse onward. On another occasion, as he was returning from the house, the mob insisted upon his crying the Queen, the Queen. Yes, yes, was his reply but his persecutors were not content therewith, and continued to assail him as he rode slowly forward. At length, wearied with their importunity, he is said to have turned to his assailants and exclaimed, Very well, the queen then, and may all your wives be like her. Caroline was early in her attendance on the 17th of August. She entered the house at 10 o'clock, while the names of the peers were being called over. She wore a black satin dress, with a white veil over a plain laced cap. The whole body of peers rose to receive her, and she acknowledged the courtesy with that dignity which she could well assume, and which she could so readily throw off. It was not till the 19th of August that the case was actually opened by the Attorney General. The preliminary proceedings were not, however, of much interest, save on the part of the Duke of Leinster who attempted by motion to get rid of the bill at once, in which he failed, all parties being nearly agreed that there was now no possibility of retrocession. The second incident of interest was in the speech of Mr. Brougham against the bill, and the method by which it sought to crush his illustrious client. While praising her self-denying generosity, which induced her to refrain from all recrimination, he ably adverted to the anomaly of the accused person in a case of divorce being prevented from showing the guilt of her accuser. On the 19th the Attorney General opened his case. He professed his conviction that he should state nothing which he could not substantiate on proof, and, reviewing the general course of the Queen's life abroad, he deduced from it that she had been guilty of conduct which stamped her with shame as princess and as woman. Caroline entered the house towards the conclusion of his speech, shortly after which he introduced the first of the batch of Italian witnesses lodged near the house, in Cotton Garden, and whose presence there was sufficient to render uneasy the spirit of the philosopher who gave his name to the spot, and the wreck of whose library is among the richest treasures of the British Museum. The entrance of the first witness gave rise to an incident dramatic in its effect. He was the celebrated Theodore Majeki, and he no sooner appeared at the bar than the Queen, overcome, as it would seem, at seeing one who owed her much gratitude arrayed against her, exclaimed Oh, traditor! Oh, traitor! and, hurrying from the scene, took refuge in her apartment, from which she did not again issue except to return home. The chief points supposed to have been established by Majiki were that on the deck of the Polaka Bergami slept at night beneath the tent wherein the princess also slept, and that the same individual attended her when she was in the bath. The tent was partially open in the hot climate beneath which the wayfarers were traveling, and in the bath the princess wore a bathing dress, so that, if the indiscretion was undoubtedly great, 
in decorum was not, it was suggested, very seriously injured. Of the remainder of Majiki's evidence it has been well remarked, by one who heard it, that all his subsequent assertions did not, in consequence of what he implied by this statement, weigh the worth of two straws with me, for it was of the nature of inference, and deduced by the imagination. Besides, I do think he was a knowing rogue, who forgot to remember many things which perhaps might have changed the hue of his insinuations. I do not say that what he did say was not sufficient to induce a strong suspicion of guilt itself in the members of an English society, but this is the very thing complained of. The Queen was in foreign society, in peculiar circumstances, and yet our state Solomon's judge of her conduct as if she had been among the English sixteen the remark is worth something, for even at so short a distance from town as Ramsgate Sands the law of modesty does not appear to be the same as it is in other parts of England, and as for the incident of the bath, our grandfathers and grandmothers, in the heyday of their youth, used to walk in couples in the baths of bath, and no one presumed to take offence at the proceeding. The writer last quoted further remarks, as a matter worthy of observation, that Majiki did not appear to be at all shocked or shamefaced at what he said. The inference deduced is that the witness had been taught to dwell so particularly on uncomely things by one who did know how much they would revolt the English. It would indeed be revolting to go through all the evidence, it must suffice to tread our way through it as lightly and as quickly as possible. All the government witnesses deposed to an ostentation of criminality in parties who, if guilty, must have been most deeply interested in concealing all evidences of guilt, and one of whom at least knew that she was constantly watched and daily reported of. This contradiction very soon struck Lord Eldon himself, who intimated that some measures should be taken to punish perjury, if it could be proved to have been committed. It is certain that the king's case was materially damaged at a very early stage of the proceedings, not only by discrepancy in the evidence, but by the suspicious alacrity of the witnesses in tendering it. A close watcher of Majiki, when giving his evidence, says, I cannot understand why so much importance is attached to the evidence of Majiki. He did not state any one thing that indicated a remembrance of his having put a sense of indecorum on the conduct of the Queen at the time to which he referred, and in this, I think, the want of tact in those who arranged the case is glaringly obvious. As men they could not but have often seen that it is the nature of recollected transactions to affect the expression of the physiognomy, and particularly of those kinds of transactions which the traditor knew he was called to prove yet in no one instance did Majiki show that there was an image in his mind, even while uttering what were thought the most sensual demonstrations. In all the most particular instances that pointed to guilt he was as abstract as Euclid, a logarithmic transcendent could not have been more bodiless than the memory of his recollections. I do not say that he was taught by others, but I affirm that he spoke by rote seventeen many of the servants examined swore positively to much unseemliness of demeanour between Bergami and the princess, and some went very much further than this. Of these, several confessed to being hostile to the courier, some were jealous of him, but they all, despite some discrepancy of detail, kept to the leading points of their evidence, which was destructive to the reputation of the princess. Captain Briggs and Captain Peschel, with whom she had sailed, deposed to some folly, but no positive guilt. Something was attempted to be made out of the arrangement of the respective berths on board the ship commanded by the first officer, but with no remarkable success. The captain of the Polaka gave evidence that was much more damaging, with reference to the unseemliness of sleeping on deck, beneath a tent for which the heat of the atmosphere and the horses and mules that were below deck hardly offered sufficient authority. Again, there was testimony of such disgraceful conduct at inns that, if it be accepted, no other conclusion can be arrived at than that those guilty of it must not only have been lost to all sense of shame, but eager that their iniquity should be a spectacle to all beholders. As the whole case now is, 
says a contemporary writer, by making it more gross than in all human probability it could be, the evidence, where it might otherwise be trusted, is rendered unworthy of credit. But there were incidents in the drama that were not all for the audience. Nature, says the writer of the supplementary letters annexed to the diary illustrative of the court of George IV, often mixes up the sublime and the ridiculous helplessly, as it would seem, and I met today with a curious instance of her indifference. I forget how it happened, but I was driven accidentally against a curtain, and saw, in consequence, behind it Lord Castlereagh, sitting on a stair by himself, holding his hand to his ear, to keep the sound and words of the evidence which the witness under examination at the bar was giving. Notwithstanding the moody wrath of my ruminations, I could not help laughing at the discovery, and his lordship looked equally amused, and was quite as much discomposed. He smiled, and I withdrew. I met him afterwards in the lobby of the House of Commons, when he again smiled. Masons, painters, whitewashers, and waiters vied, or seemed to be, with each other in the dirty character of their depositions. Rast Eli, a groom, but discarded as a thief, did not go further, but both sides evidently considered him as an unmitigated scoundrel, and he was somehow permitted to disappear, as if either side was anxious to be rid of him. Scarcely more respectable was the woman Dumont, who dwelt on the abominations to which she swore as if she loved thinking of them. She was worse than the boatmen, bakers, and others with aliases to their names, who, however, deposed to circumstances sufficiently gross in character, and drew dreadfully strong inferences from generally slender but occasionally very suspicious premises. The loathsome mass was got through by the 7th of September, when the House adjourned till the 3rd of October. The members needed breathing time, and all parties, the public included, stood in urgent need of that peculiar civet whose virtue, according to the poet, lies in its power to sweeten the imagination. The course of the trial exhibited more than one trait illustrative of the English bar, and also of individuals. Thus, in the interim between the closing of the King's case and the opening of the Queen's defence by Mr. Brougham, the last-named gentleman went down to Yorkshire to attend the assizes there. The chief advocate of one sovereign against another was there engaged in a cause on behalf of an old woman upon whose pig cot a trespass had been committed. The tenement in question was on the border of a common of 100 acres, upon five yards of which it was alleged to have unduly encroached, and was therefore pulled down by the landlord. The poor woman sought for damages, she having held occupation by a yearly rental of sixpence, and sixpence on entering. The learned counsel pleaded his poor client's cause successfully, and, having procured for her the value of her leveled pig cot, some forty shillings, he returned to town to endeavour to plead as successfully the cause of the Queen. The reopening of the case took place on the 3rd of October. Before Mr. Brougham rose to speak, Lord Liverpool made severe introductory remarks, for the purpose of disavowing all improper dealing with the witnesses on the part of government. He also expressed his readiness to exhibit an account of all monies paid to the witnesses in support of the bill. Mr. Brougham then entered on the Queen's defence in a speech of great boldness and power. The sentiments put forth in that oration were probably not endorsed by Lord Brougham. He declared, too, that nothing should prevent him from fulfilling his duty, and that he would recriminate upon the king if he found it necessary to do so. The threat gave some uneasiness to ministers, but they trusted, nevertheless, to the learned counsel's discretion. He would have been justified in the public mind if he had realized his promise. The popular opinion, however, hardly supported him in what followed, when he declared that an English advocate could look to nothing but the rights of his client, and that, even if the country itself should suffer, his feelings as a patriot must give way to his professional obligations. 
This was only one of many instances of the abuse of the very extensively abused and widely misunderstood maxim of fiat justitia ruat kailum. Denman's famous speech, which many peers thought superior to Brougham's, was partly prepared, as to some of its points, at one of the Sundays he used to spend at Holland House. There, Denman, after suggestions from Dr. Parr, resolved to draw a parallel between Caroline and Octavia, George, and Nero. And this he did with such effect as regards George IV. That, veiled as the most personal illusion was, the king never forgot him who made it. Mr. Denman, the Queen's Solicitor General, was not less legally audacious, if one may so speak, than his great leader. In a voice of thunder, and in presence of the assembled peerage of the realm, he denounced one of the king's brothers as a calumniator. Mr. Rush, who was present on the occasion, says, the words were, Come forth, thou slanderer. A denunciation, he goes on to say, the more severe from the sarcasm with which it was done, and the turn of his eye towards its object. That object was the Duke of Clarence, and in reference to the exclamation, and the fierce spirit of the hour generally, Mr. Rush says, even after the whole trial had ended, Sir Francis Burdett, just out of prison for one libel, proclaimed aloud to his constituents, and had it printed in all the papers, that the ministers all deserved to be hanged. This tempest of abuse, incessantly directed against the king and all who stood by him, was born during several months, without the slightest attempt to check or punish it, and it is too prominent a fact to be left unnoticed that the same advocate who so fearlessly uttered the above denunciation was made Attorney General when the Prince of the Blood who was the object of IT sat upon the throne, and was subsequently raised to the still higher dignity of Lord Chief Justice. By the end of the third day of the defence the testimony had assumed so favourable an aspect for the Queen that ministers began to deliberate upon the question of throwing up the bill altogether. During the following fortnight, however, the subsequent testimony was not so decidedly contradictory of what the witnesses on the other side had sworn to, and the government then decided that the bill should take its course. The first witness was a Mr. Lemon, clerk to the Queen's solicitor. His deposition was to the effect that he had been sent to Baden to solicit the attendance of Baron Dante, the Grand Duke's Chamberlain. The Baron, who was proprietor of an estate in Hanover, and who consulted his memoranda before answering the solicitation, finally, and under sanction, if not order, of his ducal master, refused to attend as a witness. Colonel St. Ledger simply proved that he did not resign his appointment in the Queen's household from any knowledge of her having conducted herself improperly, but on account of ill health. The Earl of Guilford spoke to the general propriety of the Queen's conduct abroad while under his observation, and Lord Glenbervy showed that the royal reputation had not been dimmed, in his eyes at least, during his residence in Italy, or otherwise he would not have permitted Lady Glenbervy to act even for a brief time, as lady-in-waiting to the princess. Lady Charlotte Lindsay deposed to having heard reports unfavorably affecting that reputation, but she had never seen anything to confirm them. Persons of inferior rank, in attendance on the princess, deposed to the same effect. The testimony of Dr. Holland and Mr. Mills was of a highly favorable character, exact and decisive. The evidence of other witnesses was equally favorable to the character and conduct of the courier Chamberlain, and, partly in answer to the evidence which spoke of Her Royal Highness receiving strangers in her sleeping apartments, the Earl of Landaff, who had resided in Italy with his lady and family, showed that such a circumstance was a part of the custom of Italy. Mr. Keppel Craven, who had originally engaged Bergami for the service of the princess, declared that the individual in question brought excellent testimonials with him, and that he was of respectable family and behaved with propriety. Mr. Craven added that he had heard much about spies, and that he had admonished the princess touching the being seen with Bergami in attendance as a servant. 
This evidence was corroborated by that of Sir W. Gell. A writer, commenting upon the testimony of these witnesses and that given on the other side, remarks, that the witnesses on the king's side told improbable stories, and none of them had the look of speaking from recollection, there is a visible difference between the expression of the countenance in telling a recollection and an imagination, especially such stories as they told 18 it was further proved that, if Bergami kissed the princess's hand, he did no more than what was commonly done. By respectable Italian servants by way of homage to their mistress. This plain sailing was, however, somewhat marred by the contradictory evidence of Lieutenant Flynn, and even that of Lieutenant Haunam was sufficient to show that the princess, if not the most gross, was certainly the most indiscreet, of ladies. Other witnesses spoke to dresses and dances, which had been described as disgraceful in their character, being really harmless, and others again showed that certain undefeating sights could not have been seen by the witnesses who had sworn to having been spectators of them from the place in which they stood. Again, the evidence did not lack which proved the purchasing of testimony on the other side, and some excitement was raised when, on the presence of Rast Ali being required, it was found that he had been permitted to leave the country. In the opinion of some, he had been conveyed away by the prosecuting party. A few thought he had disappeared with the connivance of both sides. The entire evidence was closed on the 30th of October. Allusion has been already made to Mr. Denman's speech, which was ably made, now, in summing up the evidence for the defense. It closed rather unaptly in terms, the remembrance of which embittered many years of the speaker's life for it seemed to undo all that had been previously said and done, this, my lords, is the highest tribunal on earth, it can only be exceeded by that where all the world shall be judged, and the secrets of all hearts laid open. I invoke you, my lords, therefore, to imitate the wisdom, justice, and beneficence of that high and sacred authority who said to the woman brought before him, If no accuser come forward, neither will I condemn thee. Go in peace, and sin no more. The lords adjourned to the 2nd of November, from which day to the 6th the peers were engaged in debates upon the evidence, almost every member assigning reasons for the vote he intended to give. Mr. Rush describes the character of the debates as the case approached its close. It was stormy in the extreme. Earl Grey declared that, if their lordships passed the bill, it would prove the most disastrous step the House had ever taken. Earl Grosvenor said that, feeling as he did the evils which the erasure of the Queen's name from the liturgy, a measure taken before her trial came on, was likely to entail upon the nation, as well as its repugnance to law and justice, he would, had he been Archbishop of Canterbury, have thrown the prayer book in the king's face sooner than have consented to it. On the other hand, the Duke of Montrose said, even after the ministers had abandoned the bill, that, so convinced was he of her guilt, whatever others might think to do, he, for one, would never acknowledge her as his queen. The bill, however, was not yet abandoned. The house divided on the sixth of the month, on the second reading, which was carried by 123 to 95, giving ministers a majority of 28. The Queen immediately signed a protest against the nature of the proceeding. The document terminated with these words, she now most deliberately, and before God, asserts that she is wholly innocent of the crime laid to her charge, and she awaits with unabated confidence the final result of this unparalleled investigation and as she signed the protest she exclaimed, with a dash of her pen, there, Caroline Regina, in spite of them. By a clever manoeuvre of her friends the ministers were next cast into a minority. The House had gone into committee on the divorce clause. The clause was distasteful to some of the bishops. Dr. Howley, indeed, is said to have held that the king could do no wrong, even if he broke the seventh commandment. Others, however, 
thought that a man so notoriously guilty in that respect was not justified in seeking to destroy his wife, even if she were as guilty as he was. The clause was objected to by many peers, and popularly it was distasteful for something of the same reasons. The ministers, thinking to gain a point by abandoning a clause, moved the omission of this very clause of divorce. But the Queen's friends immediately saw that, by the retaining of the clause, the bishops and others who preferred the bill without it would be less likely to vote for the passing of the bill itself. They accordingly voted that the divorce clause should be retained, and the ministers, in a minority on this point, proposed the third reading of the bill with the clause in question in the body of it. 108 voted for it, and 99 against it. The ministry were thus only in a majority of nine exactly the number of the peers who were members of the cabinet and after a short delay Lord Liverpool made a merit of surrendering the measure as an offering to popular feeling, although they had carried the bill with too small a majority, as he confessed, to enable ministers to act upon it. The Queen was in her own apartment in the House of Lords when the intelligence was brought her by her excited counsel that the Bill of Pains and Penalties had been abandoned. She received the intimation in perfect silence, hardly seeming to comprehend the fact, or perhaps scarcely knowing how it should be appreciated. The ministers had carried their bill, but even their withdrawing of it would not prove her guiltless. I shall never forget, says one present, what was my emotion when it was announced to me that the bill of pains and penalties was to be abandoned. I was walking towards the west end of the long corridor of the House of Lords, wrapped in reverie, when one of the doorkeepers touched me on the shoulder and told me the news. I turned instantly to go back into the house, when I met the Queen coming out alone from her waiting room, preceded by an usher. She had been there unknown to me. I stopped involuntarily. I could not, indeed, proceed, for she had a dazed look, more tragical than consternation, she passed me. The usher pushed open the folding doors of the great staircase, she began to descend, and I followed instinctively two or three steps behind her. She was evidently all shuddering, and she took hold of the banisters, pausing for a moment. Oh that sudden clutch with which she caught the railing. Never say again to me that any actor can feel like a principal. It was a visible manifestation of unspeakable grief and echoing of the voice of the soul. Four or five persons came in from below before she reached the bottom of the stairs. I think Alderman Wood was one of them, but I was in indescribable confusion. I rushed past, and out into the hastily assembling crowd. I knew not where I was, but in a moment a shouting in the balcony above, on which a number of gentlemen from the interior of the house were gathering, roused me. The multitude then began to cheer, but at first there was a kind of stupor. The sympathy, however, soon became general, and, winged by the voice, soon spread up the street. Everyone instantly, between Charing Cross and Whitehall, turned and came rushing down, filling old and new palace yards as if a deluge was unsloosed. 19 it was asked by many why Bergami himself had not been summoned to deny upon oath any charge of guilt with the Queen, but Mr. Denman had given sufficient reason in his speech. If, he said, any man guilty of the charge was examined he would deny it. I firmly believe the feeling among mankind in such a case would triumph over morality it would be found better to violate the oath than betray the victim. This is, doubtless, true, but like the concluding sentence of Denman's speech, already quoted, it seemed to some persons to damage as much as defend. The Queen had said, in her fear of her Attorney General, if my head is placed on Temple Bar, it will be through Mr. Brougham. She stood in greater peril from the studied words of Denman than from the unpremeditated and impetuous utterances of Brougham. The Queen's own utterances did not want for boldness. It is reported of her having said at the time of the trial that she was, perhaps, not altogether blameless, 
since she had certainly lived with Mrs. Fitzherbert's husband. Chapter 11 Tristis Gloria The result of the Queen's trial advantageous to neither party the Queen's application to Parliament for a residence Lord Liverpool's reply royal message from the Queen to Parliament, and its discourteous reception the Queen goes to St. Paul's to return thanks uncharitable conduct of the cathedral authorities their unseemly behaviour rebuked by the Lord Mayor revenue for the Queen recommended by the King accepted by her the coronation of George IV the Queen claims a right to take part in the ceremony her right discussed not allowed determines to be present the Queen appears at the Abbey, and is refused admittance with a broken spirit retires her sense of degradation the king labours to give a clad to his coronation the coronation festival in Westminster Hall described appearance of the Duke of Wellington his banquet to the king the king's speech on the occasion true greatness of the Duke anecdote of Louis XIV and Lord Stair Regal banquet to the foreign ministers the Duke of Wellington appears as an Austrian general incident of the coronation Lord Londonderry's banquet to the minister of Louis Napoleon. The Queen was in tears when the people were rejoicing, less certainly for her sake than for the popular victory which had been achieved. There was nothing in the issue of the trial for any party to rejoice at. The ministry could not exult, for although they had carried the bill which declared the Queen worthy of degradation from her rights and privileges, rank and station, yet they refrained from acting upon it, because the popular voice was hoarse with menace, so unfairly had the case of the two antagonists been tried before the August Tribunal of the Peers. The popular voice had been heeded, and was satisfied with the triumph. Caroline must have felt that she was really of but secondary account in the matter, that the victory was not for her, and that, righteously or unrighteously, her reputation had been irretrievably shaken into ruins. Her great spirit, however, was as yet undaunted. The bill was no sooner withdrawn than she formally applied to Lord Liverpool to be furnished with a fitting place of residence and a suitable provision. The Premier's reply informed Her Majesty that the King was by no means disposed to permit her to reside in any of the royal palaces, but that the pecuniary allowance which she had hitherto enjoyed would be continued to her until Parliament should again meet for the regular dispatch of business. Caroline, determined to harass her husband, next sent the following note to the Prime Minister the Queen requests Lord Liverpool to inform His Majesty of the Queen's intention to present herself next Thursday in person at the King's drawing room, to have the opportunity of presenting a petition to His Majesty for obtaining her rights. The following humiliating minute was accordingly made to guide the King if the Queen should decline delivering her petition into any hands but the King's, the King should not be advised to permit her to come up to the drawing room, but should himself go down to the room where the Queen is, attended by such of his household and his ministers as may be there, and receive the petition. Then